Welcome to Tech Hype, a series that debunks misunderstandings around emerging technologies, provides nuanced insight into the real benefits and risks, and cuts through the hype to identify effective technical and policy strategies. I'm your host, Brandy Nonaki. Each episode in this series focuses on a hype technology. In this episode, we're taking a bit of a different approach and focusing on debunking social media trust and safety. When Elon Musk took over Twitter, I don't think that their head of trust and safety at the time, Yoel Roth, could have ever, ever imagined that he would find himself on the receiving end of a coordinated harassment campaign on the platform, one instigated by Musk himself. Musk at the time had released the Twitter files, a set of internal communications that claimed to demonstrate wrongdoings by the company to censor content. Much of those files consisted of UL's emails and communications he had with his team. Musk, our self-proclaimed chief twit, later took to Twitter and endorsed an out-of-context reinterpretation of an excerpt from UL's PhD dissertation in a way that led to a barrage of homophobic and anti-Semitic threats, which ultimately led to UL and his family having to flee and sell their home. While platform trust and safety teams are in place to mitigate situations like this, mitigate the spread of harmful content and conduct, their efforts have been facing increased scrutiny. I'm joined today by Dr. Yoel Roth, a former head of trust and safety at Twitter and now a UC Berkeley Technology Policy Fellow, co-hosted by the Citrus Policy Lab in the Goldman School of Public Policy. Yoel, thank you so much for joining me today for this episode of Tech Hype. Thanks for having me. Of course, yeah. I think it's really important that we start with a definition. What in the world is trust and safety at social media companies? Trust and safety means a lot of different things at different companies and in different contexts. But the overall mission of the field is to make technology helpful, harmless, and aligned with the expectations of its users. I want to break those apart a little bit. In general, especially when we're talking about social media platforms, trust and safety has four main components. The first of those is safety. Safety involves thinking about the different ways that technology might be misused and crafting policies, enforcements, and technologies to address those potential harms to people. Okay. We think a lot about what the human rights frameworks are that underlie policies, thinking about things like freedom of expression, physical safety, and we try to build those into the policies that undergird the technology that people are using. And so a foundational piece of trust and safety is ensuring that not only are people physically safe and protected from the harms that could be caused by others, but also that they themselves feel safe engaging with a technical system. The second piece of trust and safety is integrity. Integrity means creating technology that is aligned with the expectations of its users and is resilient to attempts against manipulation. An easy example of this is anti-spam efforts. You create a technical system and you know that people are going to try to abuse it to send bulk or unsolicited communication, to try to sell people stuff, to carry out scams. People want to use technology that they can trust. They want to believe that the people they're interacting with are who they say they are and are who you expect. And so a core responsibility of trust and safety is to make sure that if you come to a social media platform or to a product, you have the experience that you're expecting and you can find credible, trustworthy information as you're using that product. Okay, so meeting those expectations of the user. So we have safety, integrity, and then... A third piece of it is control. Okay. When people are using technology products, they want to feel that they're in the driver's seat. And a responsibility of trust and safety is making sure that those products give people the ability to manage their experience in the ways that they want. A lot of times this takes the form of product features like block and mute, so that if you're having an unwanted interaction with somebody, you can make them go away. But increasingly, trust and safety is branching into more sophisticated forms of user control through things like algorithmic choice, where you might give people the ability to pick what algorithm is recommending content to them. And those types of controls are an essential part of ensuring that 
it's not just the developers of a technology, but it's users who are in the driver's seat. Uh, I want to get more into this idea of control later on because I know there's pieces of legislation that will compel platforms to actually give end users more control over their recommender system. And my knee jerk reaction is, can we be trusted with that power? So let's definitely talk totally. about that a lot more. So, so we had, what did we have? With safety, We've had safety, integrity, safety. control. And then the fourth piece, and what I really think kind of undergirds all of this is transparency. Trust in technology is built on understanding. People can't trust systems that they don't understand. And they would have no reason to trust me as a head of trust and safety or Twitter as a company if they don't understand why companies and people are making the decisions that they are. And that's built on a foundation of transparency, access to data, and an open understanding of how systems are built and managed. This can involve everything from transparency reports that explain how and why platforms are making decisions. Just this week, your, you know, Elon Musk uh, put the API behind a pretty big paywall, yeah. which is going to completely obliterate public interest research. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, $42,000 a month for 0.3% of the Twitter firehose seems like a pretty pretty unaffordable rate for a lot of the researchers that have been instrumental to building people's understandings of social media. You know, it's it's always been interesting how, even though Twitter is not the biggest social media platform, it's by far the most studied. Something like 60 to 70% of all published academic research about social media studies Twitter. Why? Like, why would you study not the dominant platform? And you study it because it's where the data is available. And it's always been such a highlight of Twitter that it lets researchers access data typically for free to help them understand what's going on on the service. And that's certainly in researchers' interest because they have access to data. But I think it's also in the public interest because there's more supervision. There's more governance. You're not just taking Twitter's word for it. There are people who have the data to be able to prove that if my team says that we were removing more abusive content, that we actually were. Yes. And now you can't do that. Yes, Yo, I'm so happy that you're saying this because I have been long arguing that actually platforms opening up more data actually benefits them because they can collaborate, use the collective brain power of all of those researchers to help them develop a better, safer product. Yes, I think that's exactly right. Like if you look at any of the big problems that social media has to wrestle with, from nation state disinformation to abuse and harassment, all of those problems are easier to solve when you approach them as community and collective security problems. If you assume that the only way to solve that problem is hire all the really smart people, bring them in house, and then solve the problem by yourself, you're kind of doomed to failure, right? You're going to run out of resources before you deal with the problem. Right. Of you can never address the scale that you need to. So why not crowdsource the research efforts? Exactly. And also you might have a myopic view if you're doing the yeah. research from inside the company. Yes. So the goal of Tech Hype is to debunk misunderstandings around emerging tech. Today, we're focused on an aspect of emerging tech trust and safety teams. So could you please debunk three misunderstandings? The first misunderstanding I want to talk about is that trust and safety is just censorship on a whim. We talk a lot about censorship lately, and a lot of it focuses on the role that social media platforms play. But the reality of trust and safety work is pretty different. Trust and safety is all about managing complex social systems. It's made of people. Twitter is millions of people interacting with each other, sometimes in productive and generative ways, and sometimes in really scary and dangerous ways. And trust and safety's intervention in that is not to censor or restrict, but to think about how those dynamics of free expression and speech might put people in conflict or in tension with each other. If you're participating in a public conversation and all that you're getting is somebody else yelling at you and insulting you, a reasonable response to that is to stop participating. Why would you subject yourself to that? And we think of that as a chilling effect, as something that through one person's actions and expression could drive another person away. Right. And at Twitter, we saw a lot of that over the years as a, as a business question. Many people chose not to use Twitter because they perceived it as being harmful or abusive or overrun with misinformation. And so the role of trust and safety is not to capriciously censor, it's to think about 
how do you encourage as many people as possible to participate safely so that collectively it creates more opportunities for speech? The second misunderstanding is that trust and safety is a dictatorship. People look at tech companies and they think of key figures like Mark Zuckerberg, like Jack Dorsey, like Elon Musk, or let's say like me, and believe that we have unlimited power to make arbitrary decisions. You don't. I mean, oh, it certainly never felt that way. I'm sure it did but, not. But the field of trust and safety is really built to deal with that problem of capriciousness by creating a system of laws and a system of justice that makes it so that individual decisions don't matter as much. If every single content moderation decision had to go up to the CEO of a company, you could never operate a platform of Facebook's size or Twitter's size, or even a much, much smaller platform. Right. And so what you need is a system of rules and justice that can scale to address that in a consistent and fair way. Drawing on some of the fields of criminal justice, we talk a lot in Trust and Safety about the notion of procedural justice. The idea that people are less concerned with the outcome of a decision than with the fairness of the process that arrives at that decision. And so we're focused as a field in creating procedurally just outcomes, a system of rules that are written, that are consistent, mm -hmm. that can be enforced fairly and impartially, and that don't rely on the judgment of one individual, whether it's me or Elon Musk, to make the call. And so if you look at how these decisions get made in practice, it's very much about how the rules are crafted, how they're communicated, and how they're enforced, not about dictatorial judgment by specific individuals. Yeah, I'm really happy that you're talking about this procedural nature and that you said trust and safety as a field so where is trust and safety as a field right now? Is it there? Uh, is there a lot more work that needs to be done to set those sort of standards of what is appropriate procedurally? So the field of trust and safety is about 15 years old by some estimates, and it's evolved a lot in that time. A key piece of that evolution has been this focus on procedure and scalability. We've gone from an internet that felt small enough and manageable enough that you didn't really need rules. You could just kind of deal with the occasional bad actor when they came up to now being a field where you have to address this type of malicious conduct at the scale of millions of posts per day. And that requires a lot of investment in technology and in process. But the other, the other form of maturation that's happened in trust and safety, and this gets to the third big misconception, is that Trust and safety is just about banning people and about deleting posts. Mm. One of the biggest things that's changed since I started at Twitter in 2015 through to the present is that there's a much bigger toolkit of interventions against potentially harmful conduct. When the only thing you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but now there's a much more robust toolbox of interventions. In 2015, if somebody was doing something bad on Twitter, we could ban them or we could delete their tweet. But now there's interventions available to platforms that involve things like not recommending or amplifying content. So saying it's maybe not good enough to suggest, but not bad enough to remove it altogether. Mm -hmm. Or interventions like applying labels to potential misinformation, things that don't suppress or censor speech, but instead offer more speech and context for people who are looking at it. These are brand new in the grand scheme of things. Right. And, and new tools. Yeah. And so I think that really fundamentally changes the meaning of trust and safety. It takes it from being the people who decide whether to ban accounts into being a much broader yeah. governance function that has a lot of other tools at its disposal. Yeah, it moves from kind of feeling disciplinary to more, okay, how do we actually make this space safer and work for everybody? And I also imagine that the development of this toolkit was informed by research with academic researchers and probably API access might have helped out that research. It did, right? I can say firsthand, when Twitter was building some of its new interventions in the content moderation space, notably our labels on misinformation, a big focus of that was informing it with empirical research. One of the first things that we did was a large-scale study of what Twitter's users wanted us to do. Mm -hmm. A preponderance of Twitter's users around the world, in every market we operate, consistently said, Twitter needs to do something about misinformation. And when we asked them, okay, what's that something? Mm -hmm. There was actually a pretty big spectrum of responses. Some people said, get rid of it. I never want to see it. But actually most people said, 
we want you to offer us credible, authoritative alternatives and context. And so we built the ability to do that. We built curation features that consolidated expert viewpoints and packaged them in an easy to use way. And we introduced new labels in the product. So instead of trying to fight an endless tide of misinformation by just deleting it one post at a time, we start to add labels that allow people to make these judgments for themselves. Yeah. And that was one, a community sourced intervention and two, a really powerful way of addressing these dynamics of harmful information without just resorting to censorship. So we've talked a little bit about the benefits and risks of where social media platforms are going. Let's talk a little bit about the benefits and risks of actual trust and safety teams. The biggest benefit of trust and safety work is that it yields meaningful real world impact. In the good old days, we used to talk about the difference between things that happened online and things that happened IRL in real life. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have moved away from talking that way because they recognize that what happens online doesn't stay online. It has real consequences on people's lived experience. Trust and safety work directly intervenes in that. There's no clearer example than trust and safety reviews and reports of child sexual abuse media directly resulting in the arrest of child predators mm -hmm. through reports submitted to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. This is something that every major tech company invests heavily in. Twitter invested immensely in this space, and we could see the results of that work. When Twitter would submit cyber tips, it allowed people to actually take action offline and arrest the bad guys. And that intervention is a really powerful thing that platforms have at their disposal, and that's at the core of trust and safety. The second benefit of trust and safety work is really its ability to protect and advocate for the most vulnerable users of technological platforms. A lot of times when developers are building software, they think about most of their users. They think about yeah. the majority of the community. Trust and safety's mandate is specifically to advocate for what engineers sometimes call the edge cases, right. the corner cases. We think about what would happen if a human rights activist in a hostile country was using this? Mm -hmm. What would it look like if a drag queen was using it? What would it look like if somebody whose experience is not like that of an American engineer sitting in Silicon Valley was using this product? And that advocacy allows products to represent a more diverse global constituency of users and also to make products that ultimately are better for human rights and better for humanity. People think of trust and safety as being a cost center something that detracts from a company's bottom line rather than adds to it. And I would say it's really the opposite. Trust and safety is a driver of growth and retention on social media. Tarleton Gillespie has talked about how the product that's offered by social media platforms is content moderation. That's the differentiator. And people will choose to use services that have robust moderation, that is transparent, that promotes safety and integrity, that gives people control, and they'll choose not to use platforms that don't have that. That's a business objective. There is an imperative for C-suites to think about these issues because it's something that can drive growth. Yeah, absolutely. It can actually be a competitive advantage yes. in the market. Absolutely. Okay, so you've talked about all the benefits, though. Are there any risks for trust and safety teams? So the first big risk of trust and safety work is thinking that it's one and done. You mentioned earlier this idea of whack-a-troll or whack-a-mole efforts. The truth is there's always going to be another. Mm -hmm. Trust and safety operates in an adversarial domain. It's the practice of addressing threats that are constantly changing and evolving and shifting, not only because the technology is changing, but also because bad actors and their goals and objectives are changing. There is no finish line for trust and safety work. And that might sound at one level like it's demoralizing because you're never done. But on the other hand, you have to recognize that what you are dealing with when you work in trust and safety are concerted attempts to manipulate and disrupt technology that should be operating in the public's interest. And so you can't treat this as something where there's a finish line or a mission accomplished moment. It's going to be a sustained ongoing investment like information security is or like any other security domain could be. The second big risk of trust and safety, especially as the industry practices it right now, is being too American and too Western focused. Mm -hmm. The users of social media are global, but the biggest players in this space are predominantly American companies based here in California. And even if it's unintentional, that leads to certain types of systemic biases and inequalities 
in how trust and safety work is carried out. Trust and safety work is hard at the best of times. It's hard to parse things in English and reasonable minds can differ about phrases that are well understood in somebody's native tongue. But now imagine doing that in a language that you're not an expert in. Imagine needing to moderate content in Arabic. Imagine needing to moderate content in Burmese. These are languages that are spoken by lots of people who are using social media, but not necessarily the people who work at social media platforms. And that lack of context can sometimes be a major obstacle to robust content moderation. Yeah, there's too a uh, Western view on what should be left online and how to appropriately moderate content. That's right. The majority of people who use social media platforms are not American. Right. And I think if what you are doing is moderating just for an American audience or American regulators or Western press, you might be addressing your PR problems, but you're not meeting the needs of the majority of your users who live outside of the United States and outside of the West. So how do we address that? I think there's a few strategies. The first is build diversity into trust and safety teams, right? You need to have staff that are representative of the people who use your product. And that doesn't mean they need to be located on the ground in each of these countries, but you need to be very intentional about how you build teams to do this work. But the second strategy comes back to openness. If you turn trust and safety into a community effort empowered by open access to data, open APIs, then you can have all of your users around the world helping you solve these problems in nuanced, locally contextualized ways that you can't do if trust and safety is just a black box that lives in Silicon Valley. Uh, so how do we get the companies to actually do that to support API access and research collaborations? When you talk to me, it's clear the value that it brings to the companies themselves, but we're not actually seeing that on the ground. Yeah. Look, I think if companies think about this rationally, it is the rational investment to make. But if they won't do it, I think regulation has a really important role to play here. Um, I look at proposed regulation like the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act here in the United States that would modify Section 230 of, of the Communications Decency Act to make CDA 230 protections contingent on providing data access to researchers. And I think that's a really promising direction. Make it so that platforms have to make data available, and certainly they get legal liability protections as a first order result, but I also think eventually it's in the platform's interest. The DSA in Europe has similar provisions about requiring platforms to share data with researchers doing ethical public interest work I think if platforms won't do it themselves, the law has a really important role to play in making this this public interest research possible. Um, so, Yoel, you've talked a lot about the benefits and risks of trust and safety teams. You know, in the tech hype series, we always end on what are some concrete technical and policy strategies that we can take? So what do you think we can do? I think there's three critical steps here. The first is promote transparency at all costs. Thank you. We are dealing with a fundamental deficit of trust and understanding in social media. Even where companies try to do the right things, people don't believe that that's what's happening. And I think that's to the detriment of the companies themselves and also to the detriment of public trust in these incredibly important institutions that can be really socially transformative. And so we deal with that by rebuilding trust on a foundation of understanding and transparency. Companies have to do a better job of talking about not just what decisions they make, but how they make them. Explain policies, explain technologies, explain user controls, explain the really hard trade-offs that go into trust and safety work. I, A lot of times companies shy away from transparency because they think they'll reveal trade secrets or it will let people game the system in some way. My experience is that the benefits of transparency nearly always outweigh its risks and costs. And so the first thing that I think companies and the industry and regulators should be thinking about is how do we promote more transparency so that people can understand more about social media? I, yes, completely agree with you. And I'm thinking about a tweet that Elon Musk sent um, around the time he you know, was going to release this big explosive Twitter files, you know, the, the phrase that sunshine is the greatest disinfectant. 
that it, that it would open up and everybody would see what was actually happening on the platform. But then actions speak a lot louder than words where we have the API being completely closed. So it's transparency when convenient, but not transparency when it might actually help the company become better. That's right. I mean, I agree enthusiastically with that phrase. And you know, one of the big transparency measures we implemented at Twitter, publishing comprehensive data sets whenever we would take down nation state influence operations, our internal name for it was Project Sunlight because we believed sunlight is the best disinfectant. But doing that work is hard. It's a lot harder than just giving somebody access to a bunch of my old emails. Yeah, exactly. And unfortunately, um, so any other policy or technical strategies? Yeah. I think the second piece is for companies to be really intentional about how they do the work of trust and safety and how their teams are structured. A lot of times, companies can think about trust and safety as being a checkbox on the way to a product launch. Did trust and safety sign off on this? Did we do a trust and safety review? Yeah. But if you do it that way, it happens after you've already built a product potentially a product that has really fundamental challenges and flaws associated with it. An alternative approach is one where trust and safety is a partner to product and engineering teams throughout the life cycle of a product. We talk about concepts like privacy by design and safety by design, and those are all ways of thinking about product development as being dynamic and being informed by trust and safety analysis before there's even a single user of a product. Mm -hmm. And so I'd really encourage companies to think about how do you treat trust and safety, not as a compliance mechanism, not as a legal mandate, but as a core part of how you build and develop products. Yeah, products that are just better. That's right. Are you seeing companies actually doing that? Do you see that trend where, where they are working with trust and safety teams from the very beginning, or is it still this kind of afterthought? It's a bit of a mixed bag. Okay. A lot of companies have started moving in this direction because they recognize that it results in better products that are safer and that have fewer problems down the road. Twitter was doing some of this work. Unfortunately, those teams are no longer at the company. But we're seeing some of the new entrants into the social media space build with trust and safety by design from the very beginning. And I think that that mentality is going to result in better products and fewer downstream trust and safety concerns. Well, Yoel, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about uh, trust and safety and to debunk some of the misunderstandings. Thanks for having me. Of course. Platform trust and safety teams serve an important role in mitigating harmful content and conduct. But in order to do so, supporting transparency efforts through reporting and making data available to independent researchers will better help platforms identify and mitigate harms. Additionally, incorporating privacy and security by design at the beginning rather than as an afterthought will better ensure these features mitigate harms rather than just react to them. And lastly, giving more power to the users themselves to identify and mitigate harms can help scale trust and safety efforts Tech Hype was brought to you by the Citrus Policy Lab and the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. Want to learn more about how to differentiate fact from fiction about other emerging technologies? Check out our other Tech Hype episodes at techhype.org. 